Thank you very much, uh, Moira. Uh, I did a brief presentation, but I want to more talk to it and maybe just elicit some discussion. I'm very glad that uh, I can now call you Comrade Lutisa. <laughs> Uh, but, I mean, I'm very glad that senior representatives of parliament, uh, is, a senior representative from parliament is here, because I think it's a really very important discussion. You know, we have in South Africa, if you can move to the first slide, please, a very well-established ethics framework, you know, in all legislatures. Uh, so what, does it, what do these uh, ethical codes mainly comprise of? Uh, firstly, many of them talk to the constitutional values, right? Secondly, we borrowed values from the UK Nolan Standards for Public Life. I think in the UK, they now call it the Standards for Public Life. So all those standards, integrity, honesty, selflessness, which we borrowed into our codes. Uh, we have rules on conflict of interest. Most of the codes have rules on conflict of interest. Then we identify that two prohibited activities in all of the codes from parliament to the legislatures. The one is you may not lobby for remuneration. And the second one is you in the parliamentary code, which is really uh, one of the things that Ben Chirac fought for is to prohibit members from doing business with the state. That was really an important development in the code. Then we know that we have established rules for the disclosure of financial interest. I think that Parliament has a long history of doing disclosure. When I left, I mean, in 2016, at that time, we, the only people who didn't disclose were people who were literally on their deathbed. You know, we always gave them an opportunity and a chance if they recovered to put it. But I mean, when people were seriously in, ill in hospital, otherwise, everybody disclosed. And, and we had entrenched that system in Parliament. And actually, Parliament's levels of transparency for the financial disclosure was extremely high. I mean, all the, it was available on the website, journalists used it, whatever. So it, there was high levels of transparency. And then, um, I, and I'm talking not only about Parliament here, but also about the provincial legislatures. They have proper systems to investigate. So the code does reflect all the, the investigation processes. <clears throat> Most of them have stipulated sanctions. So there may be a debate about how strong the sanctions are, etc. One of the things that we also did when we amended the code um, was to say that we, you know, the parliament is restricted in terms of the constitution. A committee of parliament cannot expel a member of parliament, and that is correct, because if you have an abusive democracy, you can use a process like this to expel members based on party political uh, considerations. So I think that was one of the most important things. There's a lot of critique about, you know, the ethics committee not being able to expel a member, but it's actually not correct. That critique is incorrect, because if you have that, you can have potentially, I think it was in Peru once, where the prime minister really used the ethics committee to expel people who opposed him. So we must be careful. That's an important check and balance in a democracy. Um, and then, of course, one of the things we put in the new code, I don't know if it's ever been implemented, I doubt it, but was where the, the corruption, because one of the big things is that people were found guilty of doing improper conduct, 10 million, 5 million, and the maximum fine you can give them is 30 days salary. Uh, so there was, um, you know, so what what they said is that where people were found guilty of high levels of corruption, the code currently has that that actually you can find them commensurate with the improper conduct. But I don't think it's ever been used. Um, most legislatures, so, so if you look at the ethics framework for elected representatives in South Africa, most legislatures and metros have officials who are responsible for the implementation of the code. Uh, so in fact, the situation is not as dire as we like to think. Uh, some people, uh, you know, the work I do in the Northwest, there is an integrity commissioner who is independent. And I think in smaller, smaller jurisdictions, it's actually better to have an independent commissioner because, you know, in 
in places where there's smaller populations, people tend to know each other and they, they develop a culture of fear if there's impropriety. So I think it's correct that you have an integrity commissioner. Maybe it's something that parliament can look at. But I think that in parliament, the ethics committees have usually been quite good, actually, you know, bar a few incidences here and there. And then there's the Ex Executive Members Ethics Act, which is implemented by the by by uh, by the president's office and the premier's office all over the country. So this is really the framework, and I'm focusing now on elected representatives. So if we can go to the next slide, and you know, functioning in theory investigations complaints. Why then is there such a disjuncture? between the public trust, and I'll come to the slide of the public trust, but why is there such a disjuncture between what the public expects from members and, and the ethical codes? So what are the public expectations of members? And I, I'm just taking this as a kind of lay citizen. I didn't go and look deep into the research. But first of all, elected members are expected to fulfill their constitutional obligation of oversight um, of a constitutional mandate of passing laws uh, to ensure, of course, accountability, which is fundamental to, to what the constitution requires, to passing laws and on the exercise of uh, exercise uh, oversight on the exercise. That is the expectation. Do your job to hold government accountable. Uh, and then, of course, one of the things we must facilitate more discussion and research and debate. Uh, and maybe not research, but just to kind of entrench what is the representative role of members in South Africa? Because people understand it implicitly, but I think that there isn't a depth of understanding. And I think part of what uh, the public expects, you know, they want to see members, for example. But we have a proportional system in which parties choose to field members in a constituency or not. I mean, I know that the ANC has constituency offices. From the time when I was in parliament, for example, the DA decided not to do that. They have a sectoral approach to engaging their constituency. I, I, I think the IFP don't really have offices either. So what we're seeing, I, the EFF has offices. So the visibility and the actual symbolic representation where, member, where people see their membership is actually something that's lacking. And then, <clears throat> and I think one of the biggest problems in our democracy and the failure in this, you know, in that state capture is not that it's not only that bad people did bad things, but good people remain silent. And that is the crux of the failure of our ethical system, is that when good people did very little. Um, and then, of course, you know, we are in a quandary. There are party loyalties, and we have no doubt that it works the same all over the world. But also, how do you, in a PR system where all the power is in the party on who becomes an MP. This, this balance between party obligations and public responsibility. So I'm not going to be here to suggest many, many kind of alternatives, but I'm saying this is where the debate must lie in the ethics stuff, because these are not easy questions. And then, of course, you know, so I call it two things. I call it a uh, micro and macro it's, it's not uh, so the micro is the behavior of the individual in a broad system right but state capture can only happen if there's like a breach of the macro ethics like everybody combined colluding to actually um, prevent the state from functioning effectively so there's a micro the individual behavior and the more macro at the level of the party etc when the party is to a large extent captured etc and i think that these things will arise no matter who's in power you know because the concentration of power will always create difficulty and then of course what what the public wants is please explain to us on why you've taken decisions. And I think we have a public participation program, but the public participation program is not enough if you engage with the public, but actually you working on the interest of a, of a minority, you know, a minority or an elite, whatever. So I think that we need to look at those things. Where, where then do we need to make the changes? And what do we need to change? Uh, I didn't include, can we go to the next slide, please?
So if you see the Afrobarometer survey from 2206 to 2021, you know, they had six different surveys. In 2006, 54% uh, of people had a, a lot of somewhat trust in government. Where we're sitting now, it's at 27. So if you look at the trust has fallen by half. It's, it's a huge drop. Uh, so we also need to find out what do we need to do to actually make this public kind of to move those numbers. Because I think that how, you know, people gave, and it, you know, often the, the discourse and the narrative in the public domain is that uh, people just vote out of, uh, you know, they're like voting for you or whatever. It's not the case. People have and understand, but I think as the years gone by, they're slowly losing trust and confidence. And this is for Parliament. It's not the President and the others I didn't put up because I don't want to burden you with too many slides. Uh, as it is, I have 20 minutes when I see that. Can we um, go to the next slide, please? So I think that I have two proposals I want to make, and I'm going to tell it to you up front. The one is that I think we need to develop a single ethical code for all elected representatives. Because what I think what happens is that people, it's too confusing. The public expectation of what you do when you're elected is the same across the public, across. And I think if you have a single ethical code, which talks to, um, which talks to the key issues that faces people, number one. And number two, I think that we need to put in our codes this thing about what does public interest mean? Because every single code is premised on working for the public interest. But the, the public interest is a vague and nebulous term, and anybody can impute any values to it, right? And I'm saying that for South Africa, I'm not saying this is this will work, but we need to develop a kind of social contract around ethics. And that social contract will try will be based on working for the public interest. Right. So I think um, So I you know, I, I tried to do some research on this public interest stuff for the last week. <laughs> And actually, there are very contradictory things. But I think that I found this this uh, uh, thing at all in the Sage Journal. And I think that even though they talk about public interest to define public interest in administrative decision making, I think it's a useful one for us to, to begin a discussion about. So number one, public interest is the fiduciary duties of the commons as defined and constrained by constitutional principles. So in other words, to meet the, you know, the social justice requirements of the constitution, all of it, because I think very often you focus only on the behavior of an individual in ethical codes. And I think broadly what we're saying is that members of parliament need to work towards the obtaining of all the constitutional values. So that is fundamental, you know, so non-racialism, non-sexism, whatever else. So that's the one. Two, that policies and no state can have policies that are not congruent to the democratic values which we've outlined. So they must be congruent to the democratic values. And then the practice of non-idiosyncratic now, I mean, I had to go and look that up because I was trying to work out. I mean, I know what's idiosyncrasies, but I thought, oh my goodness. But actually what it means, like a kind of, it's not based on an individual. Many of, many times we make rules. Some people I know in some of my friends often say that the constitution was written for a president like Mandela. And that's, uh, so what we're saying is we make policies for non-idiosyncratic. So it's not based on individual, but based on a generic kind of code which holds for no matter who is in power. Um, and administer so and uh, and universal universalized ethical administrative leadership. So that when you do it, you actually have to bear in mind, you know, this word ethics and morals, it's uh, people conflate it, but I think they're two different things. Ethics is, a, I think it's about the professional conduct. So the, the ethics of your profession, 
and decision making, so ethical decision making. But I think that we can work with that. What I'm saying is I don't have the answer to how it is or how we're going to put it in the code. But I think that if you put a, a clause which talks to the principles, because, you know, the Kenyan code, for example, talks in a bit of detail about the role of members of the representative and the public interest roles. But I think we need to expand it for our own context so that actually it almost becomes like a contract. And it's symbolic if that thing is explicitly said in the code. Because when you do training for members, etc., you're reinforcing that thought of public accountability in a, in a strong way. Uh, and then, of course, uh, uh, there is another view that uh, public interest is found in four values, accountability, legality, integrity, and responsiveness. So you can see there is a workable, and some of our codes do have, or in fact, all of the codes have got these, uh, these values. And the constitution, our constitution has these values. So there's nothing contradictory about that. But I think that largely not because members don't know that but largely because we need to symbolically entrench the public uh, the public accountability of members uh, if we can go to the next slide please so we have a myriad of codes of conduct you know that parliament has a code of conduct parliament has a registrar I think the Northwest, Gauteng, I'm not sure of the Eastern Cape, but I think they have uh, integrity commissioners. The rest have registrars of members' interest. At the municipal level, you have the Municipal uh, Structures Act, which has a code of conduct, but it allows uh, local municipalities to adopt with those key principles additional requirements. Uh, the code of conduct in Parliament and the legislatures have a place for the disclosure of the financial interest from members, partners, and spouses, but uh, the municipalities don't have that. And so just to give you a sense, um, I did a survey for CASAC two, three years ago um, on, on the extent to which um, uh, the, um, what is CASAC now? The, yeah, the council, Lawson is going to really go get me for the council for the Edma, advancement, <laughs> advancement of the South African constitution. I know what it does, but uh, I just, uh, it just eluded me for a minute. I can, you know, I can claim age. <laughs> uh, so uh, Kesek uh, asked me to do an assessment. Basically, the assessment was, it was a very basic kind of level of engagement we wrote to parliament, all the legislatures and all the metros in South Africa and asked them for a copy of the financial disclosure. So in some of the legislatures, I'm not gonna name people and stuff like that's not necessary, but in some of the legislatures, I didn't even get a single reply. I wrote about six, you know, people who know me as a registrar, they know that I'm very persistent. I used to get a hundred percent disclosure because I persisted. I waited outside caucus sometimes to find members who are not submitting to catch them. <laughs> so, but but I'm very persistent. So I wrote about six or seven times to some of those municipalities. I double checked addresses and that, and I had no response. Um, in some of the legislatures, they were not able to provide um, the disclosure because remember, in all the codes, it's public information. Some people said to me, I must go get information, public access to information. I must fill in those forms. I filled in those forms and then there was like a huge long rigmarole and still it never came. But there were quite a few that I did get. So I got responses immediately and links to the, to the information. Uh, I think some of the bigger metros, they were able to give it. Then I also did a survey on the Executive Members Ethics Act, which is quite interesting. So the, you know that the for the Executive Members Ethics Act, the president does the disclosure of uh, for the for executive members nationally and all the premiers. So I did get information from the presidency. They said to me, I must look at the code uh, at Parliament. You know, the parliamentary register is essentially the same as the register for the executives. The information around the premiers was a bit dicey 
And and then in um, most of the provinces, uh, some tried to do some fancy footwork, etc. But most of them didn't have uh, the Executive Members Ethics Act compliance to those. So so actually, it's quite interesting that nobody picked that up. So that's the one thing. So you know the 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 disclosure requirements in parliament and the legislatures is well established you know many of the codes were implemented from 1999 i think the municipal one came a little later but i mean it's long established and actually there's no reason why it shouldn't because it's really an administrative function other than the investigation of complaints but many of the other legislatures don't have the investigation necessarily in you know in the office of the registrar so um and, and there's no mechanism to ensure that people comply. It's really very much led to the leadership, the elected, the leadership, the elected leadership of an institution to make sure that there's compliance and the officials to chug away at it. So we need a mechanism for compliance. So and and as I say, my proposal really, my big proposal here is that why can't we consider it will require cooperation from um, from member you know from national provincial and local there must be some level but i think if we set a clear standard with the with proper requirements and we entrench that this is what you expect from your elected representative and this is how they expect it to conduct themselves and we have a single instrument which holds everybody equally accountable. I think the Executive Members Ethics Act must stand because of course the, the discretionary power of executive members is far higher than, um, than members of parliament, etc. So I think the discretion, because uh, for example, the Executive Members Ethics Act says that members, uh, executive members can't work for remuneration. Right, it's clearly stated. So you can't work, but this is not, you know, working is defined as working. You have particular hours, etc. There's no prohibition from doing business unless it has conflict of interest. There's conflict of interest, so there's no prohibition from doing business unless there's a conflict of interest. Then, um, so I think the executive, anyways, it's a requirement of the constitution. So we have to ensure that. But I think that. By and large, if we create a single system, then my other point attached to this is probably on the next slide, is that I think we should have a single database where all the members disclosure, a portal for all the disclosure, the disclosure of all members. I know that some NGOs maybe 10 years ago tried it, but it's a massive process. I mean, if you look at the number of local entities, you look at the number of provincial, national, I think at the legislature level, it's still manageable. But I think that if it's a single project to improve the ethical governance, what we can have is we can have a database that's easily accessible. You see, that will also allow where there's collusion between people at different levels of government. So if I own a comp if if my partner owns a company and another MEC is in the same company and I'm at local government, somebody else and somebody else at national government, you can easily find those links to prevent the kind of corruption. Uh, so I think that that's why a national portal, which is searchable, makes a lot of sense. And the information must be then what happens is you can produce that. Now in Canada, they have an interesting uh, office called the Office of Standards. The, that person coordinates, they look at the rules around um, party funding, they look at the rules related to ethical standards. So as things change, you know, in our system, what was the biggest problem during state capture was that people were given lots of hospitality. And in the Executive Ethics Act, hospitality is... The, <laughs> is required to be disclosed but there's no upper limit you know so i think that what we need to look at every whatever you know if i trace back say because i i've been in that field for so long in the earlier years right in the beginning members were even afraid to be part of a business and sometimes they got they didn't even want to disclose a business because they thought they looked bad by having businesses 
in the beginning years, people didn't even want to have like a CC, you know, a basic level of business. Then what happened is then there was all this impropriety related to leasing, you know. So people were like getting some kickbacks around leasing of buildings and that, that was the biggest problem. And then we had like this systematic uh, kind of state capture and there were like many stuff that I saw. So for example, you know, there was a member who I investigated. Uh, she, uh, she passed away eventually. She was from the Northern Cape. Uh, she, what she did is she was part of that block consortium, right? Where what they did is she came to national parliament from a DG there and they had colluded. The reason she came there was that she they wanted to collude around the sh shared social services centers, right? Uh, and so, and the thing was to to penetrate the MINMAC in social development, to actually influence the giving of those tenders. And most, most of them were leasing. The company that they colluded with actually was a company that owned, when in the beginning when they started the collusion, the company was worth about five million. In the end, it was worth billions. So that's massive amount. You know, when they rented property in the Northern Cape, they rented a space for parking in in Calvinia huh? at a square meter rate higher than the retail stores of Centen. You know, that Centen Center there. And in fact, those people never even mowed the lawn, the, the grass there. Because when we went to have a look at it, I mean, they didn't even mow the lawn. So people actually, because in Calvinia is like in the middle of nowhere, there's no parking issues there. So, and people parked uh, on the side of the road. And the per so actually that was, and, and if you look at the way they managed that, it was a level, a test drive for the state capture because what they did is they moved from local levels, small levels of leasing to coming for this big shared social services center. Then we had the big, uh, in fact, and that woman, the, the only reason all of that was exposed was she deferred the bribe that she got as a DG for when she arrived at parliament. And when she came to parliament, she received all the gifts that was promised to her, you know. So she built, added onto her house for a couple of hundred thousand. But she had a fallout with the bookkeeper of the company. She, she They had some name calling between them. And this woman arrived, I'm not lying to you, with like boxes and boxes, A4 boxes of of evidence, like almost 5,000 pages of evidence. And said, you know, so that's the other thing about bad people. They're always rude. <laughs> and they create their own problems. Oh, I don't have much time. I'm going to go now. Um, yeah. Can we, so, and then we need to look at the the implementation of the Executive Members Ethics Act, I think, in the provinces. That's an area for scrutiny. The next thing, next slide. Oh, okay. Now, um, if we look at this, right, what are, these are minor matters, which I just want to talk to. Uh, for example, the review of the Executive Members Ethics Act, there was a draft published, but I don't think it's ever been completed. And this thing comes from 2016, 2017, the public protector, because, you know, this thing about the kind of long term, this is an important issue that mustn't fall off the agenda. Uh, so this comes from the public protector report. I think there needs to be an upper limit on gifts received by members. I don't think that anybody will give you more than 10,000 for nothing, <laughs> even 5,000. Why would somebody give you a gift for 100,000, et cetera? Um, I, in the pre, in the Executive Members Ethics Act, there's a there's a regulation which says if you receive a gift of more than a thousand rand, you must request the permission of the president to retain it. I think a thousand is too low. It, you know, one of the things we need to balance is to make sure that we don't create too much of an administrative burden, but at the same time, we need to make sure that there's proper accountability. I mean, if a minister can be sold for five thousand rand, I mean that's really cheap rate. But anyways. Um, so I think that uh, there needs to be an upper limit and it must be a sensible upper limit. And any other gift over that limit should be donated to the state. Um, 
So I think that one of the big things we need to look at following the state capture stuff is the question of lobbying. There's a prohibition on lobbying in parliament, right? You cannot, as a member, lobby for remuneration. But actually, those lobbying companies, and in most countries in the world, there is like people lobbyists. and they have to submit to, to the members. So actually, that's a responsibility of lobbyists. Because what happens, Parliament is quite free and open. Everybody here knows. And all these people have all kinds of people, and they just walk in there and do their thing. And I think there needs to be some level of regulation. Not, I'm not calling for a closed Parliament, by the way. Um, can we go to the last sli next slide, please? Oh, are those my slides? Okay, I, I have a few things if I've got two or three minutes. One of the things I think needs to be looked at is um, is the question of um, work outside the legislature. The way the system works, and when we amended the code, I don't think it's functioning. Uh, it's that you require permission from your political party. And the and annually, political parties need to explain their reasoning for providing permission. Because, you know, when the code was initially ad adopted in 97, there was, um, I think the ANC at that time wanted to prohibit members from working outside parliament. But there were lots of the old MPs who were, you know, they had law firms and all of that. And because they couldn't reach compromise, they said each party will actually determine uh, how they, whether they provide permission. And so I know that generally, I don't know if that practice is gone or whatever, but before the chief whoops in the beginning years, they never allowed people to be to run a legal practice. There was a case afterwards, one of the chiefs actually was a, was in the portfolio committee on local government. And then on the in his legal capacity, he was suing a municipality. And also, uh, you know, so I think that that rule. So what we said is that when you exercise the discretion at a party level you need to give a public explanation but i think that rule is observed in the in the kind of non-compliance <laughs> nobody publishes those so that's the one thing so i think as i say that uh, remunerated employment i think one of the things you also got to accept you know what we have now is people move from business to politics and from politics to business and and this clear like movement well, I suppose it allows members some kind of financial security, but at the same time that, you know, moving from one space to the next actually also creates weaknesses in the ethical system. So really, I was just giving you a very practical breakdown based on my own experience on, on the codes of conduct.